All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes All black everything, all black polos All black medallions, yeah, all black, <laughs> yo Welcome to Left of Black, I'm your host Mark Anthony Neal We are honored to be joined by Professor Dorothy E. Roberts, the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology, and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander Professor of Civil Rights at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of several books, including the classic Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty from 1997, Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, which was published in 2002, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, which was published in 2011. And she is joining us today to talk about what is also short to the front of classic. Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Children and How Abolition Can Build a Safer World, published by Basic Books. How are you doing today, Professor Roberts? I'm doing well. You know, first off, this is just simply an amazing book um the range of insight and the number of times i had to put it down because i was just simply so angry you know for what's happening to black and brown children that we can't protect and native children um it tapped into some of my own fears of when i had when i was a father mm -hmm. and had little ones you know that i that i cared for and i kind of worked in the world with and you know took them to supermarkets and things like that there're just so many different pressure points in which the state puts real harmful pressure on Black families. Um, and you unpack so much of this in Torn Apart. Talk a little bit about how you came to this book. Well, I'd have to go back to when I was working on Killing the Black Body back in the late 1980s, early 1990s. <laughs> and what drew me to begin writing that book was the prosecution of Black women who were pregnant and using drugs. Mm -hmm. And I was doing research on that. I wrote a, a law review article, my first article about it, and then began to do more research about the longstanding devaluation of Black mothers by US policy and practice and laws. Uh, and culture and all of that. And uh, that's when I found out about the truth of the so-called child welfare system, because those same Black mothers who were being prosecuted were also having their newborn children taken away from them. And in fact, mm -hmm. while there were hundreds of prosecutions of Black mothers, there were thousands and thousands who were having their babies taken from them because of a positive drug test. And I realized that that was just the tip of the iceberg. And in fact, this was a giant state apparatus that was removing thousands and thousands of black children from their homes. At the time, uh, around 2000, black children were four times more likely to be taken by Child Protective Services from their families and white children. And the largest demographic group of children racially, you know, in uh, foster care uh, was black children. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there were parts of the nation where one in 10 black children were being taken. Actually, that's, that's the number now still today. One in 10 black children can expect to be taken from their families by the time they reach age 18. And so that was my introduction to it. I was teaching at Northwestern at the time and I met a black mother named Jornel who I write about both in Shattered Bonds and Torn Apart, who introduced me to other black mothers who were fighting to get their children back. I started attending child welfare proceedings in Chicago and family court. And, you know, you notice right away in Chicago that every single family you know, before the court was a black family. And it's just so striking uh, that uh, this seemed to be, as, as I wrote in Shattered Bonds, if, if you came with no preconception, 
you okay. would have to conclude if this was a separate system to punish Black families. And I was just astounded that this wasn't seen as a national crisis, that it wasn't seen as a major form of racial inequality. Uh, there, there wasn't a national outcry against it. And so as soon as I finished Killing the Black Body, I started work on Shattered Bonds, The Color of mm -hmm. Child Welfare. Uh, and now 21 years later, with the situation basically the same, you know, the, the disparity has, has lessened somewhat, but Black children are still much more likely to be put in foster care and be investigated. Now the number is, and one thing that's changed is we have better statistics, people looking mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. this. So we now know from a recent study that more than half of Black children will be subjected to a child welfare investigation by the time they reach age 18. You know, these numbers are just off the charts, astounding. And so I decided to write a new book that took a, you know, a stronger stand that this system is a form of white supremacy and racism, yeah. and it has to be abolished. There's, it's, it's founded on the idea that the way to solve problems, to solve children's unmet needs is to take them from their families. And the families targeted by it are the most marginalized families in the nation. And that's the essence of this system. It, you know, it's ne it was never designed as a system to truly improve children's welfare. It's designed as a system to excuse yeah. the, you know, the grave inequalities in our society that are what harm Black children, not their parents. Yeah. And so as long as it's, it's rooted in that ideology, that way of thinking, that purpose, that design. It cannot be reformed. And, you know, believe me, I worked for 20 years on trying to reform it. In, you know, in lots of ways, a major class action lawsuit I was involved in for nine years in Washington State, where I served as an expert trying to reform the system. So I have experience, a lot of experience in trying to fix this system. And uh, I was encouraged to write a preface for a 20th anniversary edition of Shattered Bonds. And I decided, no, I, I need to write hmm. an entirely new book with the new evidence we have of how harmful this is to Black and other families entangled in this system and with a stronger call to abolish it and replace it with a radically different way of supporting families. Let me ask you this question. You know, when you kind of peruse the body of work that's being produced under the name of African-American studies or Black studies now, you know, books around Black Lives Matter, uh, police abolition, prison abolition, responses to critical race theory, reparations, we could go on and on. You know, there's nothing really sexy and exciting about talking about foster care. Yeah. And when we do see narratives from a Black perspective on foster care, they tend to be memoirish. Yeah. Um, it, they're either books or films about people who survived foster care and, yeah. and, and survived, right, the, the evil Black mother in that context. Oh, um, yeah. I, what has been the response to the book thus far, right, that, that we should, in fact, have this real conversation about foster care mm -hmm. and the important pivot that you make here to link it to a broader abolitionist project. Yeah, well, that's something that influenced me a lot over those 20 years between Shattered Bonds and Torn Apart was that I became more familiar with abolitionist thinking, its principles, its strategies, uh, its philosophy, as well as the actions being implemented around it. And so I understood better the need for abolition, what that would mean uh, and I think you're right that there is less of an urgency around mm -hmm. what I call the family policing system, because it really polices families. And it's also uh, a big part of what I write about in Torn Apart is how it's so connected 
entangled with criminal law enforcement and the criminal punishment system. Uh, but most people who haven't been entangled with it themselves, they don't realize this because, you know, unlike the criminal punishment system where you know it's designed to punish people. You know, we might debate whether it's right. good to punish people right. that way right. or not. Right. But everybody knows that it's designed to punish people. Whereas people believe, most people believe that the child welfare system and foster care and child protective services you know, do what the name says. And <laughs> they are designed to help children and support families. And so you've got to convince people about how this system actually operates. And then another important thing you pointed out were the stereotypes surrounding the narratives we tend to hear about foster care. I mean, there's so many terrible disparaging stereotypes about black mothers. So this was part of the subject of my book, Killing right. Black Body. Right. And those very same stereotypes that have advocated for uh, limiting Black women's fertility and punishing Black women for being pregnant and having children, those st same stereotypes, you know, that we're dangerous as mothers, that we uh, pass down a depraved lifestyle to our children, and also importantly, that we don't really have loving bonds with our children. Yep. You know, that, that stereotype was part of what fueled the criminalization of, of pregnant Black women was this idea that they didn't really care for their babies. And that's why they smoked crack while they were pregnant. They should be punished for it. And similarly, the Black uh, welfare queen, you know, the idea that she didn't really care about her children. She just got she pregnant to get a, a money. welfare right. check. And right. then she spent the money on herself. So these images are so prevalent in U.S. culture, dominant culture. But, you know, they also circulate in Black communities Absolutely. as well. And so, you know, the, the idea that these children need to be saved from their, both their dangerous Black mothers and then their absent Black fathers. I mean, the other stereotype right. is that Black fathers don't, they, they just go around getting women pregnant. They don't even care a hoot about their children. They don't even know who their children are. So, they, you know, the, you take those two stereotypes together and you get this complete, almost complete, uh, just ignorance or not caring dismissal of the harms that happen to Black families when you take children away from them. Yeah. There's just so little concern about that. And so uh, that's something that we really have to tackle. Uh, you know, it's so deep, you know, tackling these stereotypes, these really, so I think some of the most, the deepest seated a stereotypes about black people are this idea that black the, the black families are dysfunctional and black children need to be saved from their families. Uh, those there that's it's so prevalent in child welfare meetings and literature and policy and practice, and that's what we have to cut through and and show some respect for Black people's right. families and change the policies we have now that target them for destruction and recognize, you know, those are the stereotypes that allow these kinds of practices to go on. But let's recognize that this is a form of white supremacist oppression against Black communities, just like Prisons are a form of oppression. Right. We have to see historically and today that family policing is a weapon used by the state against Black communities. It is disruptive. It's, dis it's so disruptive to investigate families, blame them for their problems, take children away, put them in a damaging foster care system where there are mountains of evidence showing that outcomes for children in foster care are terrible. And yes, there are examples, uh, as you pointed out, you, this is what you see in the movies and you know, at um, programs where they put the, the exceptional case of foster right. children who have succeeded and, and who come to talk about how they're so glad they were taken from their families. Although that 
that I, I that's an exception though if right. from my perspective it certainly is exceptional in terms of the outcomes that we know happen to children in foster care okay. again notwithstanding those who have survived and thrived often because there was someone outside the system right. who reached out to them. Who intervened but, on their behalf. Yeah. Yes, but we cannot, because there are those cases of, thank goodness, children who have survived and thrived despite being taken from their families and put in foster care, despite the harms. I'm not discounting harms children do experience in their homes. But we have to take into account that this is an affirmative state system that is designed to harm, it's structured to harm mm -hmm. children. And you know, my call and call of increasing numbers of people is to abolish that system that's so harmful and develop, build, create ways of protecting children, truly keeping children safe, truly supporting families that don't result in these harms. Uh, and, you know, you asked me, what's the response uh, to my book? It's been, I think most of the response has been very positive um, because there is a growing movement to abolish family policing. And this is the first book. Uh, I think my book Shattered Bonds, you know, <laughs> for 20 years remained Uh, uh but, you know, I'm not the, I don't want to seem conceited or anything, but it was the, you know, the, right. the main book advocating for ending the system and now torn apart, I, I'm hoping, and people have told me is useful Absolutely. as text for this growing movement. And so I, I've been embraced by people who are uh, working to end the system, led by parents and youth who have been impacted by it. Uh, but there's also pushback. Uh, there's pushback from some child welfare uh, researchers and policymakers. There's the concern that this is going to leave vulnerable children at risk in their homes. Um, there's, uh, you know, they're, they're the people who are involved in the system who are trying to defend uh, their continuing work in the system. Uh, and there's always been this group of child welfare researchers that try to excuse the, the obvious blatant racial disparities by saying that the disparities are there because Black children need the services right. of the child welfare system more. And uh, some have even advocated increased child right. removals from black communities. Uh, and of course, there's also this child saving mentality of uh, various groups, including some uh, conservative Christian evangelicals, mm -hmm. uh, but not just them, you know, some white liberal <laughs> and non-religious people also who, promote this idea that white people need to come in and save black children, adopt them and give them better lives than their families could give them. I, I'd like to think of myself as a relatively enlightened person. When I hear any news story about child protective services, my own imagination goes to the worst context. Um, but one of the things that you unravel in this book is that the randomness of the ways in which the state gets attached to people's lives, uh, you know, a kid just running off in the park as any kid will do, um, and a Karen walks by <laughs> and calls 911, mm -hmm. and it becomes a whole elaborate process that transcends that moment, but has people coming to your house, you know, trying to figure out whether or not you're a good homekeeper or not. Right. Right. Um, the women who get punished for trying to be their own advocates, mm -hmm. right? getting their own psychologists, right? Yeah. To, to do it to attest who they are. Mm -hmm. I, I can think of any number of times, you know, when my daughters were very young, 
and and being conscious of not disciplining them in certain kinds of ways mm -hmm. that my mother would have disciplined me yeah. uh, because I was always wary of someone watching that and feeling the need to report me to somebody. Um, how did some, talking to some of these women and hearing these stories, how were you able to process that? And, and were there any stories that you really didn't get a chance to tell in the book that you wish you would have? So I, I like the way you frame that about the randomness of it, uh, because it is true that usually when we hear about the child welfare system in the media, it's because a child has been killed at home by right. a family member uh, after, you know, this is very common, a child known to the system. Right. And so this is what brings along the headline that this was a child who where there'd been reports of child abuse or neglect in the past. Uh, maybe caseworkers had visited the home. They kept the child there and the child was killed. Now, these are relatively rare instances. Right. Of course, they're tragic. They're terrible. We should want to prevent them. But it's interesting that the response then is, well, that means we need to heighten the intensity of involvement of the system. We need more funding for the system. We need more caseworkers. We need to investigate more homes. When what these stories tell you is that the system failed. It didn't work to protect these children. And so uh, the, we're, what we're hearing are stories of failure, but the main failure isn't children who are harmed despite being known to the system. The main failure is on the one hand, children who where there's no need to have an investigation, no need to remove children from the home, and where even if they do have problems, there are unmet needs in the home, the system doesn't provide those right. for those needs at all. And so it fails in that sense. And then on the other hand, it also fails and is random in the sense that the U.S. has the highest childhood poverty rate of any Western nation. Now, it's been cut recently in part because of income that's been given by the government mm -hmm. in the form of, uh, you know, the tax credits or just checks during the COVID pandemic. And so we know, which we should have known already, that just right. giving <laughs> families more income helps to raise children out of poverty. But we still have an atrocious poverty rate in the United States with, you know, thousands upon thousands, I don't know the exact number, but many, many children in the United States going hungry, not having adequate health care, not having adequate education or clothing or shelter, certainly. I mean, so many children without uh, decent housing. And it's not their parents' fault. And the child welfare system does absolutely nothing to help those families. So this is a system, if, you, if it's supposed to be a system designed to keep children safe, protect them, improve their welfare, it's failing miserably at it. Now, if it's designed to be a system to terrorize families, especially in black and indigenous communities, it's working, it's working perfectly because that is exactly what it does. Uh, and that's something I learned from the black mothers I met with in Chicago right away. And I did also a small study of families in a black segregated black neighborhood in Chicago, looking at the neighborhood wide impact where everybody knows about this system. Little kids know that there are government agents. They know what the van looks like. You know, they've had friends or they've been taken, their friends, their cousins, some, they live with the ever present fear that they're going to be taken from their families as do all the parents living in that neighborhood. It has a huge impact on the entire neighborhood. So this system works as a form of terror and disruption, but it has failed in all these ways as a system that truly improves children's welfare and keeps them safe. And so that's what, you know, that's part of why I wrote this book to get across the idea that it is designed to harm, it's structured to 
uh, to be harmful to children and families. And it succeeds as at that. You have this line, a section heading late in the book where you say you can't fix a system that isn't broken, right? And, and it's not broken because it was intended to function exactly the way that it functions. <laughs> That's absolutely right. And we can, you know, I also point out in the book the the deep history of the system and its relationship to Black families, where we can go back to the institution of slavery, which is the origin of the idea that Black families can be separated at will uh, as they were during the slavery system with enslavers having complete authority over every member of Black families and the legal ability to tear them apart whenever it was economically beneficial or to punish family members or to give a gift of a child or or a mother or father to someone else. You know, it was just uh, legally permissible to do that. And, And the authority over Black families was in the hands of enslavers. And then after emancipation, the use of the apprenticeship system, which right. I think is the actual origin of foster care for Black families, is when white people could petition courts to ask for children to be apprenticed out, uh, Black children, uh, back sometimes to their actual former enslaver, you know, as apprentices on grounds that their families were neglecting them. And tens of thousands of Black children were put right back into virtual slavery Slavery. as a result. Uh, The use of child removal as a weapon of war by the U.S. government against Native tribes. And then then to assimilate Native children into dominant U.S. culture, the adoption policy, where it was an official policy of the U.S. government working with child welfare agencies to take Native children from their homes and tribes and get them adopted into white homes. Uh, And then for most of US history and the history of the formal child welfare system, you have the uh, just the exclusion of black children from services that white children were getting. And then once black children began to be part of the child welfare system in the 1950s and 1960s, that's when you see this explosion of foster care becoming the main service and now billions of dollars spent on maintaining children away from their families instead of providing any kind of services to the families, you know, intact families uh, and trying to keep families together. So the history of this system shows so clearly that it has been designed from the very start as an instrument of white supremacy and also class warfare, uh, punishing people who are poor. The vast majority of children in foster care come from impoverished families. It, It was always designed, again, designed as a system for impoverished families uh, con- it was connected from the beginning to welfare and families who were dependent on government funds to uh, be able to take care of their children and yeah. still is. It's you know the whole funding structure is the same part of government federal funding that uh, now, in a very stigmatized, measly way, funds, the temporary assistance to needy families. And in fact, some of the money that should be going to families through TANF goes to foster payments. So it's, you know, I mean, it's just so designed in every way, the funding, the history, the actual operation of it, not to support, not to care for, not to protect, but to terrorize, investigate, surveil, monitor, regulate, mm-hmm. and punish. Let me ask this question about optics. Um, you, you know, you, you're talking about a system that often mistakes precarity for neglect. Yes. And they can go into a white household and they can see precarity. They can see impoverishment and the need for services. 
they go into these same black hole homes with existing ideas about black people and what they see is not precarity but neglect yeah talk about that fine line right and and what informs the desire not to really see because even in some cases where you talk in the book about where children get identified and get reported on in actual black communities, right? The, the young girl who leaves the home when her mother's taking a bath to go to her grandmother's yeah. house, right? And it's as if her grandmother and all the people in the neighborhood who obviously know who this little girl is mm-hmm. aren't human and ain't capable and are incapable of providing care for this girl so that you know they can take her back home, right? That the state needs to intercede in that. <laughs> Right. Instead of allowing people to do the very human things that people do. But again, back to that question of optics. Right. Why they see neglect where it clearly is precarity. Yes. So that is so important. The confusion between precarity or, you know, just having needs, (laughs) human needs and neglect as a form of child maltreatment. So one way in which this is instituted is the very statutory definitions of neglect, which are basically the failure to meet basic needs that children have, you know, the failure to provide housing or clothing or food or uh, education or medical care. All of those are definitions of neglect in state statutes that allow for caseworkers to charge uh, parents or uh, and other family caregivers with neglecting their children, basically because they can't afford (laughs) these resources. Uh, And so it's, it's, it's a statutory matter to begin with, but statutes are interpreted differently through the lens of racism. And so, uh, the we there's evidence studies that show that it takes more of a risk to remove a white child from the home than a black child in other words the same conditions in the home will be seen as cause to take away a black child more you know it uh, more likely than a white child uh, and we can see this in reporting we can see this in Uh, decisions about child removal. Uh, I mention in the book a study that looked at, uh, uh, tested caseworkers as if they were taking a regular training, but they (laughs) put into the study pictures of a bedroom with a white child in the bedroom and a black child in the bedroom, same background. background. And caseworkers were far more likely to identify the black child as being neglected because of this so-called messy home. Uh, The authors point out that there's this notion of a messy home that is a sign of neglect, but whether home is messy or not, you know, is filtered through these, these stereotypes about race and class. Uh, And so, as you point out, think of something like a child straying away. And one of the stories I used to introduce the book is the story of Vanessa Peoples, whose little toddler uh, strayed away from a family picnic for one minute and a passerby called the police. And this ends up with Vanessa getting a ticket for child abuse. And then uh, a month later, In the end, seven police officers coming to her home, dislocating her shoulder, hog tying her. Uh, And she is still suffering uh, years later from the aftermath of this because she's on the registry as a child abuser in Colorado. And she was trained to be a nurse. She can't even uh, do the job that she trained to do. She has trouble finding an apartment. So the, her children were harmed by right. this right. intervention. And so it's it's both that there are conditions of poverty that lead to children having unmet needs because their parents can't afford to meet them that are then misinterpreted as some kind of parental pathology and the family end up being investigated and children removed from the home. You know, the example of houselessness, a family is homeless 
And the solution by Child Protective Services is to take the children away. Right. From right. The Instead of getting them a home. Right. Not yep. to get them home. <laughs> exactly. So that's one part of it that child neglect is equated with poverty and therefore it punishes impoverished families. But I think it's also important to note that the exact same behaviors that an impoverished Black mother does and is seen as neglect is not, are, are not interpreted as neglect if a wealthy white mother does the exact same thing. And one example of that is drinking alcohol, smoking marijuana, right. or using other substances in the home. Right. Um, right. Wealthy people can boast about it on the internet or even on TV right. and right. without the fear that right. their right. doctor is going to call Child Protective right. Services, services. Or somebody's right. going to knock on their door. Whereas an impoverished family, especially a Black impoverished family, is, is at risk of their child being taken away because of substance use in the home. So uh, a, a, another example is mental health issues that mm -hmm. either children or parents have. Uh, it's you know substance abuse issues, but also mental health issues, behavioral problems that children mm -hmm. have. Uh, we know that wealthy white children experience behavioral mental health issues uh, for like bulimia um, and other kinds of eating disorders, uh, mm -hmm. it is very unlikely that their doctors are going to report the parents right. to CPS right. because they right. haven't met the mental health needs of their children. Uh, whereas a, a Black teenager with a mental health issue or behavioral problem uh, is at risk and far higher risk right. of being sent to a residential treatment facility, uh, the places that often are prison-like yeah. and house disproportionate numbers of Black teenagers, uh, where I point to stories, uh, true stories in the book of Black teenagers who in recent years have been killed by staff for minor infractions at these places. So it's, it's both the failure to address the real needs of impoverished black children, uh, but also the way in which stereotypes about black families and, and poor families turn the exact same behaviors that wealthy families may engage in into a form of parental pathology that okay. needs you know, to be addressed in these harsh ways. And, and then on top of it, what we were talking about before, just ignoring the needs of most of the children who have uh, unmet needs for resources, those are by and large ignored altogether by the system. You know, one of the narratives that we've heard culturally over the last few years, Professor Roberts, this idea of black girl magic, black boy magic, right? And and it, it maps onto this idea of the resilience and the grit mm -hmm. of black children. How much of our celebration of black children's resilience actually contributes to this idea that black kids will be okay, right? If the, we take them from their families. Yeah, I think there's a, there's so many stereotypes involved in the ease with which Black children are taken from their families. I think there's the stereotypes that their families don't really love them anyway, that their families are harmful to them. And I think there is also this uh, combination of adultification and mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. resilience uh, that uh, lead to not only the easier removal of Black children from their home and, and this kind of idea that, well, maybe, you know, they may temporarily uh, be traumatized by it, but they'll get over it. Over it also, yeah. also that it's better for them to experience that than to stay in their homes. Uh, you know, there's this idea that we know that foster care harms many children, but it's still better than the harm they would experience at home. 
which is not supported by empirical studies, by the testimonies of people who've gone through the system, or even by logic. You know, it doesn't make sense to say, let's continue a system we know is harmful because we might be saving some children. Well, why don't we figure out a way to meet the needs of children, to deal with the abuse that does go on in some homes? but in a way that doesn't harm the children and their families. It, that, it just is nonsensical to say, let's continue doing harm on grounds that uh, it might've been worse. When we know that there are ways of keeping children safer and improving their welfare better, <laughs> wouldn't you prefer to do what is actually beneficial? And the, but the thing is, it goes back to what you were asking about these stereotypes, which is, as with so many policies in the United States, you know, we know the U.S. would be healthier overall if we had universal health care. Yeah, right. We know that providing income to impoverished families brings children out of poverty. You know, we know that we know what it takes to have high quality schools. We have them in many uh, you know, wealthy neighborhoods. But so it's not that we don't know how to improve the welfare of the most marginalized people in America. It's that a majority of white Americans aren't willing to enact policies like those. And so uh, that's why we have to have abolitionist movements that are thinking about how we can dismantle these carceral systems that were designed to disrupt and, uh, and uh, disempower Black communities, and at the same time build community-based resources and right. ways of dealing with the, the problems we do have, the needs we do have, the violence that does exist in homes and in neighborhoods. You know, I'm not denying that, but we know that what we have now is not working. And in fact, in many ways is making it worse. I, I mean, there's, there's long been evidence. I know I wrote an article, it's probably over a decade ago, but it's like 20 years ago about incar mass incarceration where I cited a study that showed that incarceration is, what is it, EO, I'm going to say the wrong word. It means I'm <laughs> of myself. Now, why did I even try to <laughs> Basically, it makes it worse. You know, it increases crime. It doesn't reduce crime. So, right. you know, even if you thought that the purpose of prison was to reduce crime, there's evidence that it doesn't do that. You know, I don't believe that that was the purpose to begin with. But even if you did think that, you know, right. so even if you thought that foster care was designed to improve the health and welfare of children, well, there's mounds of evidence that shows that foster care traumatizes children. It makes it more likely they're going to be incarcerated and put in juvenile detention, that they're not going to go to college, uh, that they're going to have post-traumatic stress disorders. You know, mm -hmm. we know these things. Uh, and so let's take it into account and let's work on the kinds of replacements for carceral systems that are showing promise or that we had know from history, you know, from the long history of Black communities caring for children, uh, being able to almost miraculously uh, educate and um, uh, support children after the end of the Civil War. I mean, but, you know, or even during enslavement, how Black families were able to survive and raise children under the conditions of bondage. You know, I right. mean, it's just, we have so many historical examples, Black club women creating community-based resources mm -hmm. for young mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. Uh, to help them care for their children, kinship networks outside mm -hmm. of you know, state licensing and all of that right. that have historically uh, cared for children. So 
un, you know, under difficult circumstances, Black midwives who have successfully uh, uh, cared for pregnant people uh, mm -hmm. better than what's going on now with the extremely high maternal mortality rate among Black right. women. So it, we have historical examples. We have the creative work of people engaged in transformative justice and figuring out ways to hold people accountable and heal uh, from violence, prevent violence that's better than what the police and prisons are doing. So there are ways of addressing the real human needs people have, addressing the violence that does occur in homes, uh, the neglect that does occur, but not blaming parents for the structural uh Need, the, the structural reasons why Black children have so many needs. Uh, so yeah. instead of saying, well, take them away from their homes, how can we build right. a radically different way of truly caring for children and keeping them safe and supporting families? We've been joined today by Professor Dorothy E. Roberts, the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology, and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Turner Moselle Alexander Professor of Civil Rights at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the author of many books, including the classic Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century. And we were joined today to talk about her latest book, uh, The Important Contribution contribution to this conversation, Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Families, and How Abolition Can Build a Safer, safer World, published by Basic Books. Thank you for joining us today, Professor Roberts. Thank you so much. It's an honor and pleasure to be on your program. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch, and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black, everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black.